in favor to rain down upon us because we're, we're calling out to a God that is strong, that is filled with resource and willingness uh, to bless his people who call upon his name. And so, Lord, that's what we're doing here tonight. That's why we came. We didn't come to get a check mark. We didn't come to make someone else happy. We came because we need to hear from you. In this world that is uh, beautiful, absolutely beautiful, and your creation is stunning, but it's also very, it's equally difficult. It's, it's, it's difficulty is equal to its beauty. And, and so we've come here tonight into this secluded place, into this sanctuary to find some hope and guidance. And so we thank you, Lord, that we could praise you and we rest upon your, your word that says that you're enthroned upon the praises of your people. And so uh, we realize, Lord, that you're here and that you're seating sitting on your throne and we want you there and what we mean by that Lord is that what you say goes and we want to hear your word and we want to bend our life toward it and and to let go of rebellious life and choices and stubbornness and all that in our own way and chasing our tail like a cat and we just want to live the way you want us to finally and so we want to move one step closer to that tonight Lord as we open our word we believe that it is true we believe that it is perfect and we believe lord that it is powerful and we hold your word in high regard and when it is spoken into our ears we believe that it has power to change us and so that's the type of attitude we come to you tonight with lord a willingness to change a teachable spirit we ask this in the name of jesus amen amen awesome we have a seat hallelujah right Carrying over from last week. Rowdy, maybe I just need to do this. <clears throat> Why don't you all do me a favor? Let's just, um, let's fill up these tables over here. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, get out of your comfort zone. Come on, people, let's go. Come over here. I don't want to be, I don't want to, Mimi doesn't need to be looking at my butt all night. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's move over here, someone. Come on, let's come over here. If, 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 if folks aren't coming, then we're going to fill the seats up front. Come on, I won't call on you, I promise. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, so, hey, a couple things I want to I wanna mention that Karen was not able to mention, and, and um, we don't want to overload you too much with announcement, but next week something kind of cool happened. Um, there's, this, there's this group, it's called the Extreme Tour. It's just, just a bunch of young Christian artists, musicians, and singers, and all that, and they tour the country and they, they go to like playgrounds, like impromptu. They'll find playgrounds and, and skateboard parks, and they'll find the kids that are out there that no one's loving on, and they'll do a concert just like that, right? That, they just tour around the country doing that. They just want to reach people with a message of hope in the gospel. And so um, we know someone that is part of that tour, and one of the coordinators from the tour actually called me yesterday and just... You know the scripture talks about we should make a, um, open up our homes to traveling missionaries, evangelists and such? Okay, so um, they asked if we would open up our church so that 15 artists have a place to crash next Saturday night and Sunday. I was like, well, yeah, of course. I mean, we got pews. They could sleep on couches, wherever. You know, we'll just open it up to them. And, uh, well, we'll be there at 4 o'clock on Saturday. I said, well, that's cool. I don't know how tired you're going to be, but we have a service at 6 o'clock and but you can worship with us. As a matter of fact, if you guys are all musicians and stuff, you want to lead worship, you can. She's like, that would be awesome. We would love to. Wow. So, so just like impromptu, like just out of the blue, they're just going to come and they've given us, uh, we chose, a, I chose a song list for them out of the list that they have, that they have available, that they know really, really well. Songs you all know, great songs, vertical songs, um, incredible songs. And they're going to come and they're going to lead worship. Tom's going to get up here and play bass with those guys. And they're going to lead worship Saturday night and Sunday morning. Just And then they're out of here. So come. This should be great. should be great. Yeah, it'll be fun. So there's that. Um, the other thing, too, is um, the, the folks that, you know, we clapped for the people in the coffee bar. And I do. I commend and love and thank you if you put your name down. Um, so we had, we had a meeting at the end of both services last weekend. And I shared the, the, the vision for the coffee bar. It's not just to have a coffee house just for fun. Like, there's some reason behind it. And, and, and it would just sign up. Let's make it a family affair, right? Right? Remember all that? And so we went up there, and I was, re I was like bordering on rude trying to like convince people not to sign up because like super tired of people signing up and not coming in, right? How many people love 
employees that no call, no show. You like that? Yeah, nobody likes that, right? Yeah, so already in the first week we've had it happen three times, right, since that meeting. So there is definitely, and, and no one's mad, it was, they had reasons and stuff, it's all cool, but life happens, right? But if we're going to, if we're going to promote it, we're going to put hours on the door and on Facebook and all that. We're going to shoot an ad and we're going to have music nights. and all. If we're going to do that, then you got to show up. <laughs> Man, like when people come to the door and there's a couple weeks ago, I, I showed up. I'm not on shift. I showed up. There's a young guy sitting out the door just waiting. I was like, oh, epic fumble. <laughs> fumble Ruski. There's a piece of dust. You see, you guys see that right there? How cool is that? Right? <laughs> it's just floating, right? It's not leaving. You think it's easy to preach, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. So, so anyway, if, if we need someone, listen, we need some folks on Friday afternoon from like 12 to 3 or something like that, and then again 12 to 3 on, uh, on Saturday, like super bad. Those are big days for a coffee house, right? If we're going to go full bore, like espressos and lattes and all that kind of good stuff, then we... We actually have to have like people working. So um, if you could do that, that would be super, super awesome. Please see Danielle or myself before you leave. That would be incredible if you could do that. I really believe in what we're doing. I think it would be great for our community. I think there's some real kingdom opportunity there. So uh, with that being said, I, wanna, um, I want you to open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. Please open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. That's your favorite saying in this church. Open up your Bibles too. We're going to continue in our message series that we took a break from last week as we sang our, our hallelujah. We raised our hallelujah to the Lord. And uh, we, we were a little bit loud. We were vocal. And we were, Matt, we were rowdy. We were rowdy. It was a good, last weekend was really awesome. I just got to tell you guys some, you Saturday night people. You know, we started this church on Saturday night, right? There's more people coming on Sunday now than on Saturday. I'm just, last week, Sunday killed you guys. So I'm just saying, like, if you're a little competitive, I just wouldn't let that happen anymore. I don't want to start any fights, but I just can't believe that you'd let that happen. <laughs> anyway, I'm just, just throwing it out there. Um, so, but we're going to continue our message series, uh, Need to Know. We need to know what? We need to know. John wrote this letter to uh, believers. He wrote this letter and he said, the reason I've written these things, what things? Chapter 5 says, I've written these things. Oh, that means all the things leading up to chapter 5, verse 13. And that's what we're studying. I've written all these things uh, to those who believe in the name of the Son of God, who is who? Jesus Christ, right? And, and I've written these things so that you would know that you have everlasting life, right? Uh, not so you can get saved. No, it's you're already saved uh, but there's some pitfalls we all fall into, right? And sometimes there's these major pitfalls that come our way and we stumble into them and it really jacks up our relationship with the Lord that He started way back when. I don't know when it was. Uh, but we understand that um, Jesus saves, right? Uh, you could do every single thing in this letter perfectly. But if you don't have Jesus, what do you have? Show me what you have. Nothing, right? You have nothing, right? So, so Jesus is the way. He's the one who saves, but there are clearly, all throughout Scripture, there are things that we must do in this relationship that he started whenever that was. There's some things we need to do. As a matter of fact, in the first day that the church started, Acts chapter what? Two. Pentecost, the fire comes down, the, the tongues of fire, right? They come down, the church starts. And then what happens? What does Peter say? First message of the church ever. He says, Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and the people are like, brother, what do we do? What does He say? He says, you got to repent, and you got to turn to God. There's something you need to do. Jesus saves, but you have to receive that. There's some things that you have to do. And so in this letter, we saw that here in chapter 1, right, we saw that we have to practice the truth, right? We can't just believe the truth. It says we have to practice the truth, or else you're living in spiritual darkness. Now remember, He's writing to people who are saved, not people who, are, who you think are in spiritual darkness, the ones who are not saved. He's writing to people who are saved and says, you believed in Jesus, you accepted him, but if you don't practice the truth, you're still living in spiritual darkness. It also says that you have to repent of sin. He says, if anyone claims they have no sin, they're fooling themselves. And if you say you've never sinned, you're calling God a liar. Okay, bit of advice from your pastor. That's a bad idea. Don't call God a liar. That's not going to get you in, okay? Never going to get you in. 
So, so we understand we have to repent of sin. Chapter 2, he goes on, he says, listen, we have, to, we have to obey. We must obey his commands. We must love other Christians. Say, that's hard to do. We have to stop loving the trappings of this world, right? He says, listen, don't, don't be loving the, fle- the, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. In other words, don't, don't be like passionately pursuing stuff and experiences and then having pride in accomplishing both of those things. Like that shouldn't be, that's a tough one in America because that's what we do. And so um, we know that this is dangerous, so much so that Jesus, in his parable of the sower, he gives what? How many seeds get thrown? Four, right? And the third one is the seed that, that goes into the earth, right? And it sprouts new life. Okay, what does that represent, new life? Are, are we, we're not seeds, right? But he's talking about people. And it sprouts new life, right? But then... The, the, this, this new life, it says, gets choked out because of the seduction of wealth. That's the, that's the passionate pursuit, the love of stuff and experiences. And so John is warning us against that. And so he says also in that chapter, you must remain faithful to the gospel. How do you, let me ask you this, how do you remain in a place you never were? You were because he's writing to believers. You, you, you did step into proper fellowship with God, but you must remain faithful to the gospel and you must remain in proper fellowship with God. So that's what John would warn us of so much, um, a warning that Paul would echo the same thing in the book of Colossians when he says, and now just as you accepted Christ as your Lord, so he doesn't doubt your salvation, does he? He affirms it. Just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Jesus himself, in in the Gospel of Matthew, he says those who endure to the end will be saved. Not the common teaching of those who are saved will endure to the end. Okay, We never want to get past what is written. Jesus is not mistaken. He said, those who endure to the end will be saved. Okay? And so that's just kind of a a review of where we've been. But now in chapters 3 and 4, the Apostle John, he starts to really hammer home one major theme. And along the way, he's going to mention some other minor themes, and we will as well. But the heart of much of John's remaining words in this letter is about what? Love. Love. It's the weapon of our warfare. It's the middle of our name and revolution, right? Right? What do we fight with? We don't fight with, with guns and swords, right? We fight with what? Love. Love conquers the multitude of sin. As a matter of fact, in this letter alone, in 1 John, love is mentioned, listen, 48 times. So obviously it's, it's important to God. Love is the main thrust of this letter. As a matter of fact, 1 John 4, 17 is the bullseye of all this when it says God is love right god is love now god does a lot of things god says a lot of things but god is love right and and so this 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 fact that god is love it begins to shape our view of him because a lot of people feel like like I, even i i know my my, my dear brother kyle DiGiacomo, who's leading worship there at that other church he preached last week at his church up in chicago and he and and he and he you know, he's a devout believer, you know, but even he said that his view of God was that he was like a crusty old omnipotent deity up there that was ready to punish Kyle if he didn't work hard enough for him. And that's not the case, right? What is God? Does, he's love, right? Where in love does it have this crusty old, you know, tomato-faced God who wants to rip your throat out when you do something wrong? Like, that's... That's your bad dad when you got home, when you had a bad day at work. That's not who God is. And God is love, and it shapes our view of who he is, and it defines his nature. We're supposed to be worshiping him, what? In spirit and in truth. This is the truth of who God is. He is love, and since we're supposed to be like him, then we're supposed to be loving as well. And so, um, before John gets there uh, to talk um, about... Love, 
through 3 and 4, like big time, he, he, he does something kind of strange. Before he gets there, he spends some time confronting your biggest problem and my biggest problem. It's our biggest problem. It's sin. And, you know, everybody, everybody knows that they have a problem with sin. Like, I don't care who you are. Like, I don't know about the preacher that gets up on his soapbox with the megaphone and says, you're all sinners. You're going to hell. God hates you. He hates lesbians. He hates homosexuals. He hates, you know, all that stuff. You see people doing that all the time. Like, that's really not going to lead people into a loving relationship with a God who defines himself as love. Like, that doesn't work. We all know that we have a sin problem, but before we go there to find out what's wrong with us and how to fix it, he, he talks about something different. Anyway, I want to I'm going to read this with you. Um, 1 John 3, uh, let's read 10 verses. You guys all there? You have a copy of God's Word in front of your face? Okay, awesome. Um, look here. See how, see how very much our Father loves us, for He calls us His children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't re- recognize that we are God's children because they don't know Him. Dear friends, we are already God's children but He has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. We understand that, right, folks? You understand that you don't know exactly what it's going to be like. But we know one thing. Even though all of us are different and all of us are being transformed differently day to day, not everyone's cookie cutter in this room, right? But we know one thing, that even though we don't know exactly what it's going to be like, we do know that we'll be like Him. That's a good place for any man. That's good. That's true. For we will see Him as He really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as He is pure. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins and there is no sin in Him. Anyone who continues to live in Him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know Him or understand who He is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning. Because God's life, God's anointing, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, didn't we? God's anointing is in them. And if you've bent the knee to Jesus, and He's your Lord and Savior then you are anointed. Okay? You have the anointing. Don't go looking for it anymore. You got it. Uh, so they keep on sinning because they are children of... They can't keep on sinning. That would have been a big mistake. Because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to to God. Okay, so the flow of this section of the letter is he talks a little bit about love right there at the beginning, right? And then he talks a lot about sin, and then he talks a whole lot about love. And so John starts his sin talk out with God's love, which is kind of strange to me, right? He's getting ready to kind of hammer us about sin and the sin in our life and how to fix it and who's doing it and why and all that. But before he does that, he talks he starts out by talking about God's love for you, right? And, 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 and someone in here might even just need to hear that. You know, God's love for you. Before we tell you how bad of a sinner you are and how much mistake you have and how much failure you have in your life and how to fix all that, maybe you just need to know that God loves you, right? We all need to hear that in this world of, uh, of failed friendships, right? Where, where people say that they love you and then they backstab you and then they cheat on you and they leave you and they lie to you and all those things that we have, it's so common in this world. Isn't it good to know that the creator of heaven and earth absolutely loves you, right? And it's not just love. No, see how very much our Father loves us. The Holman Christian Standard says, how great a love that God has for us. Isn't that awesome news? It's so good to know. Now, how great is God's love for you, you might ask? How, 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 how big, how great is His love for you? Well, Romans 5.8 says that God showed His great love 
by sending his son to die while you were a sinner. See, that's what real love is. We could say, I love you all day long. We had this talk today, my beautiful wife and I, and I'm so happy that she's in the service today. Yay. First time in months. Praise the Lord. It's a little distracting, I have to tell you, because I can't help but looking at her. So I'm just going to sin over here. But I love her. I'm totally derailed right now. Wow, that, that is bad. But it's so easy to say that we love somebody, but we have to, but we have to show it, right? Nobody wants to hear a bunch of words about how much you love them, how much they love you. Like, just show me your love, right? Show me the love. And we know that that's real love because that's what God did. He showed his great love. And so all of us need to show it. As a matter of fact, somewhere here in 1 John, I'm going to see it. It says, um, uh, verse 18 of chapter 4, he says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. That's real love. When we actually do something in response to these words that we've sent out saying, oh, I love my other brothers and sisters in Christ. I love my neighbor. I love, yeah, right? Show me. See, God is a God who shows his great love. And so he said, not only does he show it, right? But how about the magnitude of his love? He sent his best. His, his greatest sacrifice. He, what, what, if you said you love somebody a great deal, would you be willing to show how much you love them by giving up your, whatever your greatest treasure is? Would you be willing to give up that family heirloom that uh, passed down generation after generation and it meant so much to you? And actually it's some monetary value too. Maybe you'd have to, would you give it up to someone that was in great need or would you hold on to that thing? I've had people ask me if they could have my Bible, and I have to tell you, I don't want to give someone my Bible. It's precious. If you have your own Bible with your own notes and your own oil in the pages and your tears on the pages and all that stuff, like, you don't want to get rid of that, right? But, but how do you say you love someone if you're not willing to give up a book if they need it? What would it do for them if they read it? What would it do, what did it do for you when you read it? What would it do for them if they did? Are you willing to give up? See, doesn't it show God's, isn't it, doesn't it show the magnitude of God's love for you that he would give, that Jesus Christ would go to the cross to be whipped and beaten and killed, tortured, mocked, slapped, spit? Isn't he showing the magnitude of his great love for you? Isn't it a value statement of, of how much he loves you by what he gave up for you? It does. And that's what we need to practice. We need to show our great love. So how great is God's love for you? Well, it says here in our text that he, he calls us his children, and that's what we are. We're, we're his children, right? Not everybody is, is your child. Like I have Meredith and I, we have six kids, right? We have Chelsea and Blair and Bailey and Adriana and Jameson and Jackson. And now we have two grandsons, uh, Keegan and Ezra. And today was Ezra's little third three-year birthday party. And he's cute and everything. Um, but those are our children, right? And, and so we love them, right? We, 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 we love them. We want to... We want to, and we do help them the best that we can, and we want to provide for them, and we want to protect them from evil things, and we, of course, we have good plans for our children. If you have children, you understand what I'm saying, and we want to hang out with them, and we want to, we want to have good conversations with them, and, and we want to do anything that we can for them, and we want to lead them to the greenest of pastors of life. I mean, that's what a parent does. Why? Because they love their children, right? And this isn't a choose to love, love, right? This is a, I can't help it, love. This is a, I can't stop that love, you know? That's what kind of love we're talking about that God has. You know, I, I have a, our oldest is uh, 26 years old, Chelsea, and, and uh, you know, her and I have like a really good relationship now. We're like really good buddies, and, and we talk on the phone, and we're, I was over her house today. We were over there today for Ezra's birthday, and, and, and Chelsea and I really, really have a great relationship, but um, Meredith can tell you, like, as she was growing up, it, ha it wasn't always like that, you know? And if you've had teenagers, you understand what I'm talking about, and they're just such a blessing of the Lord. Oh, yes. <clears throat> yeah. God's word is true. doesn't matter how we feel. 
they're a blessing from the Lord. And, but anyway, she, she, it, it was over and over again, like, hey, you want to hang out? You want to, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then inevitably, like nine out of ten times, I'd get dissed because, like, a friend would want to come over and hang out with her or, you know, anything would happen. And she'd rather, right? And, and if you've ever experienced, like, that doesn't feel really, really good. And, and I would, there were times I just wanted to be like, well, you know what, just to heck with her. Just to heck with her. Of course, my wife would never want that, and she would encourage not to be that way and stuff. But, but you know, I, I wanted to just walk away, but I, I, I can't, right? I just, I, I, I love her. I, you know, I, I can't help it. And so I realized, and, and you guys probably do too, that, you know, your kids have probably crapped on you more than anybody else. Right? I mean, your kids have crapped. My, my kids have crapped on me way more than all if you added up the hundreds of people that have called this church home over the years my kids have crapped on me way more than any of you have right way more but yet i have to choose to love you guys sometimes you know what you feel me don't you like i do you always love me like every second of all the time? Like, no, right? You have to, it's the Bible telling you, you need to love Matt, okay? You need to love Matt. Okay, I love Matt, right? Because there's people in your church that make you upset and you, so, so other Christians do stuff that tick you off, but what do you have to do? You have to get past your feelings and you have to just choose, okay, I love them, right? Okay, I get it. But that's not the way it is with your kids, right? No matter how much they crap on you, you just... Love them. Now, there are moments that I want to kick them out of my Garden of Eden. And there are moments I want to lay hands on them and pray, right? Maybe I need to lay hands. They need to pray. But there are times that I want to do that. But, but listen, that I can't help but love them thing, that's what God has for you. That's kind of cool, right? It's not like that in this world. So why does God have this love as the intro into the don't sin section. And I'll just offer this one word as explanation, and that is motivation. Motivation. We're getting into this heavy section of teaching and calling out our sin and what to do with it. And so he's a good father who loves us so, so very much. He wants to help his kids do well. And so... I want to illustrate this the best way that I can, and I find that the best way to illustrate this is if we could just shift our attention for a moment from the Apostle John to the Apostle Paul, and everybody knows the Apostle Paul, just a great guy, just a ministry beast mode guy, planting churches, just, the guy was amazing, but, but prior to him being amazing, he was disgusting, right? He was a Christian killer. He, he, was, he was a powerful man. He had permission from authority. He was persecuting the church. He was watching them and encouraging people to stone Christians, arrest them, just shut down followers of Jesus Christ. That's who he was. But he had the approval and the permission of the authorities. So this guy was powerful. He had it kind of... He's not a good guy, but he had it kind of going on as, as, in a secular way. He was powerful. He had good friends in high places. He had influence. He had permission from the authority. This is who he was, but something happened. He gets radically saved, right? Jesus Christ meets him and says, you're saved now, right? Say, and so now, instead of going and persecuting the church... <laughs> he goes out planting churches and preaching the word of God, and he's healing people like crazy, right? But, but listen, at the same time, everywhere he goes, right, not only is there churches being planted and, the, and the, the word of God is being preached, but there's also pressure now from the government in the other direction. They're trying to shut him down. And he gets, and there's riots, right? And he gets whipped and he gets beaten, right? Persecuted, put in jail, shipwrecked, snake bitten. Like it's a living hell for this guy. Listen, if you get in ministry because you think everything's going to go well, you need to read the Bible. Because a lot of people get out of ministry because ministry doesn't meet their expectations. That's your expectation right there. He's the great apostle Paul. 
persecuted, riots, whipped, beaten, pushback all the time. And listen, I understand how he feels. I haven't gotten beaten for it yet. But I understand the pushback as you're trying to preach the message of God's word to people. But with all that being said, couldn't it have been easy for Paul to turn back to who he was? When you're faced with all that opposition and, and he decides, listen, I, I, okay, now I'm saved. And now I'm going to preach and I'm going to plant churches and I'm going to appoint elders and I'm going to, we're going to do all this stuff for Jesus. It's going to be awesome. And, and there's some evidence and fruit of that. Awesome. But he's also riots and whipped and beaten and hated. And, and couldn't it have been easy for him to just go, to heck with this, right? I mean, come on. It's not what I thought it was going to be. Couldn't it have been easy to turn back to that powerful guy and just say, you know what, guys, I'm going back to this team. And that, that, that bad team would have welcomed him right back, right? Because he was awesome at it. He was a great persecutor. And they would have welcomed him right back. But what kept this guy, Paul, what kept him going? I mean, because none of us have been whipped and beaten and thrown in jail for our faith. None of us are sitting up at, the, at a big lecture hall out in the public preaching the gospel to the crowds so that the all of Asia Minor heard the gospel. Like That's thousands and thousands and thousands of people. This is Paul preaching his guts out and never stopping, always relentlessly pursuing the kingdom of God, advancing the gospel. What kept this guy going? What kept him living the way God desired for him to live? He said in 1 Corinthians 9.16, Woe to me if I don't preach. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. And what, what kept him going? What made him so passionately keep going with this life that God had called him to? Was it for his own glory? We all envy the guy. The guy's amazing, right? Is that why he did it? This is why he did it. He said, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. He says, there's no glory to me. For necessity had been laid upon me. That's why. The necessity, that's a good motivator. What was it? People are going to die and go to hell if I don't, listen, if I don't speak, they might die and go to hell. It's, and you know what that says to me? It's not somebody else's job. I'm not sitting around waiting for, for, for Meredith or Karen to say it or, or Nick to preach the gospel. No, I have to open up my mouth. The necessity has been laid upon me. God put it on him and said, listen, you got to open your mouth. you got to tell people about me. You have to do it. Necessity had been laid upon me. He says in 2 Corinthians 5.11, Knowing then the fear of the Lord. There's a good motivator, right? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. The fear of, knowing then the fear of the Lord. Why? I told you so, Paul. I told you to go tell people. So not only is the necessity, because if I don't open my mouth, they may never hear. And if they may never hear, they may never know. And if they don't know, where are they going? Down. And so there's a necessity upon me, not for my glory, but for their need. And knowing the fear of the Lord, I persuade people. Listen, I'm evangelizing. I'm opening up my mouth because of the fear of the Lord. You know why? God said so. God said so. And that's why I do it. And that's why I do it. And I understand what Paul is talking about here. I can relate. And that's what makes me get up every single week. Every Monday, I go back to the study. Every weekend, I get back up here. Why? Because necessity has been laid upon me. And I know I have a healthy fear of the Lord. And he said, do it, Moses. And so I try to persuade people. So there's some good motivators right there, right? People are going to hell. God said so. Good motivators. Are they good? Are they good? Are they good? But they're, they're very, very good. But this is what I wanted you to see. Here's the bullseye of motivation. 2 Corinthians 5.14. Take a look at it. 2 Corinthians 5.14. This is what it says. <laughs> it's funny. I love Paul. He's like, um, because of the fear of the Lord... In this translation, because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. I like that translation. God knows we're sincere. I hope you know too. 
Are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we're giving you a reason to be proud of us so that you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular minister rather than having a sincere heart. Listen, he says, if it seems we are crazy, <laughs> if you think about his life, right? He, he accepts Christ. I mean, things are kind of going good for Paul, right? He's, a, he's got a powerful ministry, a bad one, but he's got a powerful one, right? And, and so things are going pretty good for this guy. He's made it in his chosen career. I'm really good at persecuting Christians. I'm actually the best at it. And, but, but now he decides to be a Christian, right? And so now he thinks maybe things will be better, but they really haven't gotten better for him. Actually, they got a lot worse. Circumstances got a lot worse. And so, yeah, I think people would say, well, you're crazy. What are you doing? Every time you go to a town, there's a riot. You get beat up and thrown in jail. What's wrong with you? I mean, if you're a good friend, wouldn't you tell your friend that? Like, dude, quit sticking your finger in the pug. Right? And this is what's happening with Paul. And he's like, he acknowledges, like, yeah, you might think that we're crazy. If it seems we're crazy, it's to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, see, it doesn't matter. So like, depending on what you see in us, like, you might think we're crazy. You might think we're on it. But no matter what, he says, either way, here's the, here's the motivator. Christ's love controls us. That's why. That's why I keep going. That's why I don't stop. That's why I live for God. That's why I preach the word. That's why I get beaten. That's why I'm willing to go to jail. That's why I won't stop living for God ever because Christ's love controls me, right? What other translations do you have out there? What are your, what is your, what's your Bible say? Christ's love what? What is it? Compels, right. What else? Anybody else have another translation? Restrains me, constrains me. What is it, what is it? other translations say? Urges us on, right? What is it? There's this great love that, that it controls what I do. It dictates what I do. That's what happened to Paul. Like, I can't help it. I'm, I'm like, I can't stop. I don't know what to do. It's like you love with your kids. They crap on you. And what do you do? I come back for more. I can't stop. Crap on me again. Constrains me, right? It, it, it keeps me here. It keeps me as a Christian. This is the thing that keeps me going. This love, it keeps me going. I can't stop it. That's the love that God has for me. Notice. It's not the love that you have for Christ. That's good too, right? That's good motivation, your love for Christ. Anybody in here love Christ? I love Christ. I love Christ. I love Christ. I love Christ. That's good motivation, right? But notice that's not really, your love for him is not really the thing that keeps him going. No, it's the love of Christ, right? It's not your love for him. It's his love for you. Man, I love, God loves me so much and he's blessed me so much and he's forgiven me of so much and where else would I go and what else would I do? Man, this guy died for me. See, the mind that's set on that reality all the time is powerfully motivated to live a holy life. But you have to be thinking about that all the time. And that's not something that he's going to do. That's something, get, raise your hand who has to do that. Who gets to choose your thoughts? You do. You have to decide what you're going to be thinking on. You need to be deciding right now whether you're paying attention to me or not, right? You, who made that decision? You did. And God says the same thing. If you'll set your mind on that, I will motivate you. But you have to be thinking about these things. And so, John, in our, in our text here in 1 John, he goes on to say that those with an eager expectation of being Christ-like when he comes back again, look what it says. It says that they will keep themselves pure just as Christ is pure. This idea of purity is, what's the, what's the topic here? What are we talking about? Don't sin, right? Stop sinning. We're talking about sin here, right? That's this whole section of the, of the letter. It's talking about sin. He says that if you have an eager expectation of being Christ-like upon his second coming, you will keep them, they'll, they'll keep themselves pure just as Christ is pure. So let me just step back for a second. For those of us that have been taught and taught and taught over and over and over again that the one who began a good work will continue to do so until the day of Christ Jesus, like that is true. 
but you have something to do with it. And I think that's the problem in the church is that we sit on our high knees just assuming that God's going to do all this stuff, but you could sit there and want it all you want, but the God that you're talking about, the one you're waiting on, he wrote a book, and in his book he's explained to you this. You have to keep yourself pure. Like you, you, can, you can rebel against what I'm saying right now, but you can't rebel against what you're reading. Right? And that's my task here, is to put before you what God's Word says. Now, you do what you want with it. But he says right here, there's something you need to do. He said, you need to keep yourself pure. Listen, Christ didn't sin, right? So you should keep yourself from sinning. And listen, you're not in it alone. God's great love for you is there. And that's your motivation to keep yourself pure. That's what the Bible says. Now, we may not like it in America because we love a gospel that says, I don't have to do anything. But that's not a saving gospel. And that's not a sustaining gospel. This is the word of God. Those who have eager expectation of being Christ-like upon his return. Listen, he wrote this to believers, right? And so if you have a... Listen, believer... If you have an eager expectation of being like Christ when he returns, then you need to keep yourself pure. Who has to keep you pure, Debbie? What does it say in the Bible? You. You. I didn't make it up. You're just, you're reading it right there. Okay. Now, before our Apostle John sin lesson begins, I want to remind you again of the lens that we are to look through when it comes to sin. Okay. Because a lot of these translations talk about if you're, a, if you're a Christian, then you won't sin. And so that would lead us to believe that there's this Christian out there. He lives up in the mountains in the Himalayas or something, and he actually lives with no sin. That he's perfect. He's made it. He's graduated. That there's a way that there's... You could not... Okay, but, but John, earlier on in the text, in, in 1 John, what does he say? Verse 8 of chapter 1, if we claim we have no sin, what's that? Have no. When is that? Past, present, future? What is it? Present, present right? So, so what does that mean? We got it right now. You got it, I got it, he's got it. We all got it, right? We got sin. Um, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. And then verse 10, the lens continues. He says, and if we claim we have not sinned, right? What's that? That's past, right? So, so let's just summarize the whole thing. Every Christian sins, right? We, we just do. And we also, not only do we know it because the Bible says it, but we know it because we know our own self. We've lived it, right? So it's not like we've reached perfection. Even Paul said, I've not reached this perfection yet, but I press on to the upward call of Christ that he called me to, right? James said that we all fail in many ways. I get all that. So the lens that we look through is that we all still sin, both in the past and currently. But, verse 5 tells us, what? Jesus came to take away our sins. Jesus came to take away our sins. Okay, so it's not that you're not going to sin because he says if you claim you have no sin, you're just fooling yourself. So we understand that all Christians sin, but Jesus came to take away. So I just jot these two things down in my notes. You might want to. One, I think that Jesus, with his great love, motivates us to slow this process down. He helps us to stop sinning. But yet we understand from the scripture that we still do, but something should happen. That This anointing inside of us gives us the desire and the power to say no to sin. Will we fail? Yes. Is there grace when we do? Big yes. But he he came to take away, to help you stop sinning, and then also take away our sins. I would say remove the wage. Does everyone understand what I mean by that? The wages of sin, the payment for your sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ. So he came to help us stop sinning and then also to remove its consequence, its penalty. Okay. Now verse 6 goes on. I don't really like... This translation, so I searched every single translation available in English, and I believe that not only is it a powerful, needed verse that you need to know, but I think, it's, I think that it's, um, 
best said in the International Standard Version. I think it's the most accurate. I think it's the most clear. And, and, and the way they say it is in complete harmony with the rest of the First John letter. And this is what it says. Did I? Yes, okay, I got it up on the screen for you. You can take a look because it's not in your Bibles. This is the International Standard Version. It says this. No one who remains in union with him keeps on sinning. So that's a big deal. Those who remain in union with him do not keep on sinning. The one who keeps on sinning, i.e., there's never been a break in the action, right? There's never been a break in the action. You know, the, the scriptures say that if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation, right? The old dies, behold, there's a new. So when you get saved, something should happen. This should be a break in the sin action, right? Something should change. Don't you agree? If you meet the living God, he takes away your sin and forgives you. Don't you think something should happen? Shouldn't it be a, hey, what's with Meredith, man? She's not doing like she used to do, right? Shouldn't there be a little bit of that in all of us that get saved? Would you agree? Yes or no? Yes, yes, no, yes, no. Are you alive? I think so. But, but, but what this says here is that if you, if you remain in union, this pattern's not going to, you're not going to keep on doing it. But the one who does keep doing it, never had a break in the action, it says, they haven't seen him or known him. See, this dude, this girl has never had a stoppage in sin because there was never a union. That person hasn't known Jesus. So saved or not saved? I would say not saved. That person's never been saved. But those who remain in union with him, right, that constant parade of easy sin in our life over and over again, that gets broken and something changes. So remember... John's audience is their Christians, the ones who have been saved, the ones who began a union. You've been, it says, I think in, in Ephesians about that you are now in union with Christ. For sure they're sinning still. We all do, right? But as he would say, if you're a Christian, if you're in union, look at verse 9. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's anointing is in them, right? They don't make a practice. That's a big word. They don't make a practice of sinning. See, that's, that clarifies what we're talking about. He said that if you claim you have no sin, you're fooling yourself. So we all agree, Christians still sin. I get it. But, this is awesome, this, this carries us to a, a whole new level of understanding, this practice thing. This t tells us that, yes, we sin, but it's not what I do normally. It's not my normal practice, right? What does a doctor do? He practices. What does he do? He goes in every day and he does it. That's what, they, that's what he does. And the scriptures say that a, that a real Christian... If they're really in union with the Lord, they will not make a practice of sinning. 1 John 5, 18, just turn the page, look over there, 5, 18. What does it say? We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning. They don't make a practice of sinning. See, there's a difference between someone who commits a sin... And then someone who is practicing a sin. Like, this is just what I do. Right? Before you were saved, I can speak of my own life. I can't speak of yours. But before I got saved, I was really good at sin. I made it a practice. I, I was, listen, my doctor's office was open 24-7. I was really good at it. That's just what I did. And I hardly ever had a moment of remorse. It had to be really, really, really bad even for me to have any guilt feelings of what I was doing. That's just what I practiced. It was the, if you looked at my life, you'd say, that's who he is. And the Bible makes it very, very clear that if you're a member of God's family, if you're in union with him, 
you will not be that person. You will not be the one that someone could look at and go, yeah, that's what they do. They make a practice of this. So now we go on and we see here the Bible is super, super harsh right here, but we need to understand truth, right? Look at verse 8. He says, uh, but when people do keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. That they belong to the devil. So, you can kind of tell who belongs to who. You know, here's another Christian thing you hear about all the time. That only God can judge. And, you know, um, I don't know your heart. Only God knows your heart, right? Only God knows if you're really saved. Well, that is true in a sense, but, but look here. You can look at somebody's life, and they can have all the crosses on their chain, and they can have Z88 stickers on their car, and they can go to church a hundred times a week, and they can put some money in the plate and all that kind of good stuff. But you know, you look at their life, and you just got to wonder, like, you look at them and you see, what's the practice of their life? What do they live like? They make all these big claims. It's kind of like the I love you thing, right? Yeah, show me. Show me that you love me. Don't just say it. Don't just wear the t-shirt. Don't just wear the bumper sticker. Show me that you love me by your life. And so the question really is here tonight for us is, what's your practice? What's your practice? Now, this is not a time to get high and holy and say, oh, I'm good, I'm good. Even if you're good, I'd say, whoa, stop. And, and, and don't evaluate your own life. Let the Holy Spirit evaluate your life. Let just... Just take a few minutes maybe here in, in, in a few, and, and let's just let, let's let that, that, that mysterious Holy Ghost kind of just go through the room and, and, and find your heart and look and see. And, go, and what, is, what is the practice of your life? How are you living right now? Like, I'm not going to cast doubt on your salvation experience like 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago when you went to the altar and you bent the knee. I'm not going to do that. Neither is John, and neither is Paul. Remember, he said, just, as, just now as you accepted Christ as Lord, like, he affirms that you got saved, but now you must continue to follow him. And so really, that's what this letter from John is all about. He said, I know that you're a believer. I know you're following Christ, but how about right now? How's the continue to follow him going now in your life? Are you still following him? Are you still listening to him? Are you still obeying him? I know that the gate is narrow, right? We all know that. The gate is narrow. And I hope that you found it and walked through that gate. And on that gate, it has one name. What's that name? Jesus, right? Jesus is the gate. But how about the difficult road that follows? Because if you pass through the gate, whenever that was, that's in the rearview mirror now, and now you're on the road to the mansion that he's got prepared for you. And on that road, how, how's that going for you? Are you still under the lordship of Christ? since you pass through the gate. So what kind of lifestyle are you practicing today? Come on. Let me just tell you this. Christians don't make a practice of sin. This is what Christians do. They confess their sin and they repent of their sin and they turn from their sin and they do as Jesus said. Okay, I forgive you. Now go sin no more. And they change. They don't make it a practice. So does sin come easily to you? Is it easy? Is it often? With not too much remorse or repentance? Or does Christ's love compel you to live righteously? What's your mind set on? I'm not talking about right now. It's easy to have your mind set on Jesus and on his word and on his love right here in church. But I'm talking about when you leave. I'm talking to me now. I'm not preaching to you anymore. You're not even in the room. What about when we leave? Am I focusing? In my, is my mind set on the great love that Christ has for me? The love that 
oftentimes will put me on my knees in worship when we sing about his great love and how he went to the cross and bled and died for me that brings me to tears and to my knees. Like, am I thinking about that when I leave? Most of the time I'm not. Remember, we, we all have sin. If we don't admit this, embrace it, you're only fooling yourself. We all stumble, we all slip up. But those that remain faithful to the gospel, those that remain faithful to fellowship between you and God, they don't make a practice of sin. They make loving obedience to Christ the practice of their life. That's what a real Christian does. Father, I, uh, I appreciate that moment a moment ago when everyone else disappeared in the room, but I know my fearful responsibility to you is also to them that are here. So I pray, God, now that you will help us all to, to again focus on your great love for us. called us to live a life that honors you. You've called us to stop sinning and begin to live righteously. I guess I speak for everyone in the room. I've tried all kinds of stuff to live right. And I keep failing. So I think as of tonight, I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on your great love for me. He said we're supposed to keep ourselves pure as Christ is pure. Well, the only way I can think of right now that I could keep myself pure is to keep my mind set on your great love for me. And Father, I would ask that you'd help us all with that. There's going to be a moment coming within the next 15 to 20 minutes where something will vie for our attention and it will glamorously and beautifully and sneakily if that's a word ask us for our attention so that we do not focus on your love anymore happens all the time and what I'm asking for, God, right now is that somehow, supernaturally, you would help us to fix our heart and our mind upon your great love. You said that nothing in heaven and on earth, no scheme of man, nothing could ever separate us from the love of God. No, no matter what our relationship with you, even if we turned away and never went back, you would not stop loving us. Because you can't help it. Because you are love. Such great love you've shown sending your son, Jesus, to die for us while we were sinners. The love that you showed was not a reciprocating love. It was an instigating love. You didn't require us to love you back. You initiated the love. You started it not in response to our love. It's just who you are. Would that love that you have for us motivate us to be like Paul and not give up? Lord, you've called us to live higher. Let your love compel us to live that way. Lord, we would ask you now that you would help us to 
partner with you in advancing your gospel. Our community is filled with lost people. It's our great desire, Lord, that our place right here that you planted, that you established, that you provided for, that it would become a great city on a hill here in the city of Leesburg and Tiberi's Fruitland Park area, Grand Island, right here. And so, Lord, I would ask that you would help us now, all of us, to give generously to that end. But generosity looks different for different people. And so, Lord, we're just going to get quiet. We're going to give you a few moments to just let your Holy Spirit do a couple things. Teach us, lead us in the way that we should give. And kind of just, like I said earlier, Lord, just to go down through the aisles here and just go to the hearts of the people. Do a little in inspection. How are we living? How are we living, Lord? Are we living the way you want us to? Are we keeping ourselves pure? Are we being obedient to you? Are we truly under the lordship of Jesus or we just say we are? Are we a son of God or son of the devil? Speak to us now, Lord.